go ahead and take a deep breath and get a snack because you're going to need it because this is cell respiration. For some kids, the hardest topic of the year. But I'll try to make it easier for you as we discuss one of the most intricate and perhaps one of the most important topics in biology, cellular respiration. The cannibalism of glucose, or the destruction of the glucose molecule, is an exergonic or exothermic reaction that releases the energy uh, which is used to power all the anabolic reactions in your body, or the reactions that require energy, the endothermic, endergonic reactions, uh, such as building proteins, uh, synthesis of, our, of DNA, uh, active transport, uh, cell division, reproduction, caring for the young, competition, hunting, growing, development, um, competing for mates, running, um, maintaining homeostasis or balance. All of these things are maintained in your body at the expense of energy, which is produced during the pro catabolic process of cell respiration. So where do we get this energy from? Now, plants uh, actually get their energy just straight from the sun. They perform photosynthesis and they make their own sugar, which they then go, go on to do uh, cell respiration on. But we would need to eat to get this energy. Um, so it's when we eat foods uh, full of carbohydrates, fats, and other things that we get the energy that's necessary for these uh, chemical reactions to take place. And it's the metabolism of these energies that produces the ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell, um, and also produces carbon dioxide and water. So over here, you have the young lady taking a deep breath. When she does that, she inhales oxygen. And when you exhale, you put out carbon dioxide. And that is part of the chemical reactions of your body, which are producing carbon dioxide in water at the expense of glucose and oxygen from the air. So you take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, mm. and then what happens in between is cell respiration. And then you get out a little bit of that, and a little bit of this. Cool. So, how does that actually happen? Glucose, C6, H12O6, all carbohydrates, remember, have a one-to-one -one ratio on their chemical compounds. So if you have six carbons over here in the glucose molecule, that means you're going to have twice as many hydrogens, so 12, and just as many oxygens, so one. And then in the presence of six oxygens, they will kind of burn to make six carbon dioxide and six uh, water molecules. So it's basically six, six six and then one glucose molecule which is one to one with six carbons each so it's a hexose sugar hex which means six o's which means sugar so it's a hexo sugar being burned in the presence of oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water as you can see part of this process also generates 36 atps of energy which the cell will then go on to use to power up the anabolic process we talked about earlier now, inside each glucose molecule, there's actually 90 ATPs of energy, 90. However, this, these, this glucose molecule will not release 36 ATPs of energy for the cell. Well, how come? Because if you look carefully, you will see that there, you still have bonds here in the carbon dioxide and in the water molecule. And some of the electrons, which are going to be transferred throughout the glucose uh, burning process inside your cells, are actually going to end up in the water rather than in other things. And so... Uh, these electrons will be transferred to oxygen and, and that will form water. And so some of the energy is conserved in the bonds of the products. Some of the energy is lost as heat that actually warms up your body. In fact, some of the glucose you burn, you burn just for the purpose of heating up your body. So um, basically, as endotherms, we have to maintain this stable internal environment and that temperature of a constant 37 to 38 degrees Celsius so that glucose burning is also partially to release this heat energy. And also, as you're going to see during the Krebs cycle, some of the material that's part of the glucose is actually transferred back to power up ox the rebuilding of oxaloacetate. So in other words, not the, the glucose molecule is not entirely catabolized. A piece of it is left and used to rebuild the molecule, which is why it's not completely burned up. And, but still, 36 ATPs out of 90, that is pretty decent. The, the cell actually makes a 38% efficiency at capturing the energy that's inside the glucose to power up our lives. And so 
um, most human engines, even the better ones, are less than 30% efficient. So this is a natural process that's better than most engines at, that are at burning uh, things like uh, diesel and gasoline. I also wanted to point out that in your body, once the glucose runs out, what happens then, you know? Uh, in animals, uh, they start burning gl glycogen. Once the glucose re uh, reserves run out inside the cell, uh, that sends a signal to the body to start converting glycogen, which is a short-term storage of energy. Glycogen is basically several of these glucose rings all struck together in, in a chain of, of, of sugars, which will basically form a long chain of polysaccharide, all branched out like that, and that's going to be glycogen. Now, it, was, it started destroying that to make glucose once glucose runs out. The liver will do that. And, and so... Glucose, glycogen is usually stored in places like the liver, the thighs, the brain, because these are the places that need the most energy. And so when the glucose runs out, it taps into, into glycogen. Once glycogen runs out, uh, oh, by the way, in plants, it would be starch, not glycogen. And the only difference is that starch is just one long molecule, maybe one or two little uh, splits in, in a molecule like amylose, which is a specific type of starch you can find in potatoes and things like that. But uh, so plants have starch. Animals have glycogen. But either way, when those energy storages are run out, then is when the organisms start tapping into fat and burning fat for energy. Which is why when you're working out, you got to work out for at least 30 minutes just to start burning fat. Because you first you're going to get through the ATP, and that's only going to take about seconds because you burn about 30, 10 million ATPs per second in your cells. So ATP is going to run out pretty fast. And then you're going to start destroying the glucose to make more ATP. But then once the glucose is over, you're going to start burning glycogen. And then when the glycogen is over, then you're going to start burning fat. So it'll be a while until all your fat is gone. Now, when you run out of fat, then the body starts attacking itself and starting destroying the proteins, which are the structures and the functional things in your body, to actually get more energy, desperate for energy. And that's why people who are starving or are anorexic look like they're literally falling apart uh, because they're starting to consume their own proteins for energy purposes. So remember that this metabolic process of cell respiration is actually involving all of these macromolecules, not just the glucose. But um, we're going to focus on the destruction of glucose in this lecture. And let's see how that happens, right? So also, before we start talking about the specific process of, of, of glucose, check it out. That in the bottom right there is the formula for photosynthesis. So over here, we have the formula for photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is exactly the opposite of cell respiration. Instead of producing water and carbon dioxide, you consume water and carbon dioxide to make sugar and, and oxygen. So it is the reversed reaction for, photos, for uh, cell respiration in which instead of releasing energy, you store energy. And ultimately, of course, that energy comes from the sun. So it is the sun that powers the molecules, of, that powers all life on Earth because the chloroplasts will combine the carbon dioxide and water through the energy of the sun to make oxygen and carbohydrates, which will then be used by plants uh, and, anim and animals to make energy for the cell. Now, I want to point out that the plant cells also have mitochondria and they also do photosynthesis and cell respiration, just like we do. The difference is that they, they can make their own sugars in the chloroplasts, like you see in the image here. So the chloroplast is basically doing the opposite of what the mitochondria do. Uh, and the chloroplast will make the sugar and the oxygen that's used by the mitochondria to make the energy. And that it's just basically a cycle of life with that uh, you have the carbon sequestration or fixation in which the carbon is fixated from the air into the biosphere in the form of glucose and then later on released once that glucose is burned. Now, remember that plants also perform cell respiration, okay? So that's a very important point. Now... Cell respiration is actually the, an example of what we call an oxidation reduction reaction. And in this reaction, it is ultimately the goal to produce a molecule called ATP, which is what you see on the screen now. Now, ATP is basically adenine, which is a nitrogenous base, the same things that show up in DNA and RNA. And then you have a five carbon sugar, in this case, ribose, just like the sugar in RNA. And then you have a three carbon sugar, three, uh, three phosphate groups attached to that. And remember that it's the last bond between the phosphate groups that stores the most energy. And it's by breaking that bond, as you can see in the diagram here, breaking that bond is what releases that energy as the ATP becomes uncharged and becomes ADP, which is diphosphate, just two phosphate groups. By combining the ATP together with another phosphate group, you have to consume energy in an anabolic process to rebuild ATP. So this charging of ATP will be powered by the destruction of glucose. And that's what this is all about, creating these batteries, which is what the cell actually uses for energy. 
but the cell needs ATP. That is the energy that the cell actually uses for life, and that is what we have to focus on creating. Now, uh, before we go on, I also point out that if you were to take out both these phosphate groups out, what you would have is one phosphate, one sugar, one nitrogenous base. That's basically a nucleotide for a, for a, a nit nit nucleic acid. So there's a very close relationship between this energy molecule and the genetic information of life, one of the most important molecules of life. That's going to become important again when we talk about uh, nucleic acids later in the year. So cell respiration is an oxidation reduction reaction. So what does that mean? An oxidation reduction reaction is a transfer of electrons. That's what's happening. Now here, electrons, you see them orbiting around the nucleus, and these electrons exist in potential gradients where, like, depending on where they are in the nucleus, they have more or less energy. And when they are transferred from one, lat one atom to the next, they may change the levels of energy. And as they do so, some of that energy is released. And that's what cell respiration is all about. Transferring the energy from one um, to, the to, the, to the next to create this differential in energy. And basically, as you can see, once, while, while one, one atom loses electrons and becomes oxidized, the other atom gains those electrons, so the electrons are traveling from one amount to the other, and that is becoming reduced. Reduced because your charge went down, because now you have negatives uh, added to your to your to your atom. So you got to become negatively charged, so you're reduced. And although it says reduced, understand that now this atom has more energy because he has more electricity, more electro electron potential. And although remember that because typically these atoms that steal electrons have a greater affinity for electrons than the atoms that they steal it from, uh, the electrons actually, will, some of the energy is released during the process, and that's the energy that the cells trap to, to create ATP. Now, the electrons, which the atom that loses electrons is actually called a reducing agent because it caused the reduction of the other one, and vice versa, that's called the oxidizing agent because it causes the other one to become oxidized. Now, in, in nature, the most common element that is, is going to force other elements to become oxidized is oxygen. It is the electron that tends to steal electrons the most, most common. So oxygen is the most common oxidizing agent, and that's why we call it oxygen, oxidation, because oxygen is the most common that's doing this out there. So electrons being transferred from one atom to the other in things that form ionic bonds or any other kinds of transfer like that, is an example of oxidation reduction reaction. And in photosynthesis and in cellular respiration, that's what's happening. For example, in here, glucose is storing lots of electrons in these bonds between the hydrocarbons and the sugars and everything else. As you destroy glucose to make carbon dioxide, all right, this is going to a lower energy state. So what's, what does that mean? That energy is going to be transferred from glucose to oxygen. And so glucose is becoming oxidized while oxygen is becoming reduced. So glu glucose becomes oxidized and becomes carbon dioxide, and then uh, uh, oxygen gets reduced, and then the hydrogen is also passed on along, and it makes water. So this is actually what's happening in cellular respiration. And remember, throughout this process, the electrons are moving from, an ad from a chemical that doesn't really have a high affinity for electrons to a chemical that really adores them, which is oxygen. And during this process, some of the energy is released, and that is the energy that is trapped sequentially, slowly but surely, through biochemical pathways by the cell to create the energy that's, that we use in our anabolic processes. Now, in our next video, we're going to be discussing how this process actually happens. And we're also going to be discussing um, the overall picture, that what you need to know, uh, the fact that you need to know about each of the processes and the overall picture of it. So. I'll see you on the actual cellular respiration video, which is part two of this lecture. Thank you.